everybody, and welcome to episode 67 of Own the Road with Auto Trader, where we make car stuff simple for Canadians. My name is Jody Lai, and I'm the editor in chief of Auto Trader. And my name is Dan Alika, and I am Auto Trader's road test editor, who was a couple minutes late this morning. Which never happens ever. I am one of those people. I love being on time, I'm usually early. Uh, this week, I'm driving the 2025 Mercedes Benz E Sprinter, so the electric Sprinter van. Uh, that only comes in the whatever I can't remember the the centimeters or millimeters, but it's a hundred and seventy inch wheelbase, and it's the high roof, so I can stand up inside of this thing. It is massive, and I knew parking was going to be a challenge. There's no way I was fitting in the underground parking here, so I was like, I'm going to show up early because the street parking that's really close to the building is, you know, there aren't very many spots, a lot of contractors around. So I was like, I'm going to give myself lots of time. I turned onto the street. At 22, so I was 20 minutes early. I'm like, this is perfect. And just trying to find spots was nearly impossible. And I had to park like so far away. So that is the first real issue that I've encountered with this van. You know, I'm a big van guy. You love it. I love van life. Uh, This is like the first time that I've been like, "Eh, not so great. I mean, practicality wise... It's it's a whole other challenge that you never really thought about. But this is testing my the whole reason I booked this. I messaged you when I found out that that it was available to us. I really want to put this to the test because my, you know, my hypothesis is that any courier service, any contractor that works kind of within city limits should be using electric vans instead of gas-powered ones. There's really no excuse, but of course, you know, rather than just make a bold claim, let's put it to the test mm-hmm. so that we can back it up with with facts. So I'm driving it this week. I'm really excited about it. Uh, it's super cool because, you know, there. I do have a sense more than any EV I've driven, except for maybe the first couple times, I do have, you know, a little bit of sense of like, you know, pride that I'm like, really? Yeah. Like it, it feels cool. Like I'm not like virtue signaling. I just feel like, hey, this is doing the right thing. Uh, in something that's immensely practical for for work, um, but it has, you know, this great benefit of not burning any gas, no tailpipe emissions. So when I'm sitting this morning, you know, windows down, it's a nice day. People are sitting there beside me stuck in traffic and I have no guilt of like, oh man, this thing's You're like idling or anything. Exactly, because the you can get the Sprinter with a diesel and I know you know, Dieselgate kind of ruined that and everybody thinks of them again as like these stinky machines. And I'm like, well, that that's the alternative with the Sprinter. So the fact that I'm not doing that, I feel like a good guy. I mean, that's awesome. I feel like it makes so much sense for businesses to do that. You know, they probably get a whole bunch of tax rebates for that 10 as well. Ten grand. So it's more than the consumer rebate. Nice. The federal rebate is $10,000. So it's really a no-brainer then. Yeah, I don't – to me, it just – and it's cool because my my friend, Jeff Crane, who's a listener of the show – shout out to Jeff uh, – he, I told him about it because he is an HVAC technician. Now, I'm not so sure it would work for him because he is constantly ping-ponging between Hamilton mm. and Toronto and he's all over the place. Uh, but he was really interested and excited when I told him I was testing this thing because for him, he spends so much time, you know, in vans or trucks, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever is on the fleet that he's given that, you know, he wants to kind of see how this plays out. So... Um, Jeff, things are looking good so far. I'll give you a full report that you can check out on autotrader.ca slash editorial in the not too distant future. I'm excited to see your report on it because I know how hyped you were. Um, but the challenge today will, I don't know if that'll affect your story at all, but it's something that people have to think about if they have, you know, can I say though, not to, I know we want to get to the, to the topic of the episode, but I've actually found, and maybe because I'm going into it with this idea that, that it's, you know, for work and it's a test and whatever, um, But, like, even being stuck in absolute grid, like, maybe the worst traffic since we've started at 1990 Studios. Really? It was just terrible. And I felt, and maybe it's because I left earlier, uh, so I got the tail end of kind of the worst of morning rush hour. But I felt, like, oddly at ease, you know, even with people doing boneheaded stuff all around me, you know, cutting cutting people off and but I just didn't really like it wasn't getting under my skin the way that it normally would so I'm hoping that continues when I do my my drive which is literally like through the downtown core I'm going to go down Young Street zip across Queen 
and, you know, kind of do like something that would be a, a classic, like, I don't know, let's say a Canada Post or a UPS route just to see how this thing does in those conditions. So I hope that my, you know, this this sense of calm and tranquility carries on. I wonder where that comes from, though, that you don't Deep get my other soul. car. Deep in my soul, my love of this van just, it coalesces in this perfect way. So question, though, when yes. you drove the Volkswagen ID Buzz, another yeah. van that you I was just living love, my best life. Were you also calm and collected? I mean, it was San Francisco and, and, and like, outside of San Fran, so I didn't really have mm. traffic to worry. And I was just, like, I mean, I loved it, so I was really stoked. Um, and I was driving with a with a fellow journalist, Mark Richardson, and he did me such a— I don't know if I told you this, um, but kind of in, in Oakland— California, there's a this kind of famous like punk venue. Okay. And it's and it's on Gilman and and it's like a not for profit and it's been running all ages shows since like the eighties. Um and I've never been there. I've never seen it in person, but I've read about it in books and seen photos. And we were driving back to the hotel after our drive day in the buzz, and I noticed the the exit. For, for Gilman as we were passing it. And I was like, oh, and I told him why I was so bummed. And Mark was like, we're going back. Like you have, you, you need to see this place. Like, you know, and it was a really nice thing That's for him really to cool. do. But, um, so I think I was just like riding the high. I love the van. Uh, we were having a good time going to Gilman. There was a brewery like next door. So I picked up some local beers all as well. All your favorite Literally, things. Literally, it was amazing. One afternoon. It was amazing. That's so, so cool. So I did have the same sense of like, you know, peace and harmony, but it was just because <laughs> like life was really good that day. I will also say if you guys have not seen Dan's video yet on the Volkswagen ID Buzz, please go watch it now. It was um, groovy. I literally cackled out loud when I saw it for the first time. It I was so funny. I didn't want to tell you what my plan was. It It hit me like that weekend. Um, so like a few days before I left, I went out to the living room and I was like, Becky, I have this idea. And she was like, oh, that's, you know, pretty funny. So I'm not giving anything away because I really want you guys to go watch it. But I, so I told her and she was like, that's a great idea. And then she was like, oh, what does Jody think? And I was like, I'm not telling her because I want it to be a surprise. And your message when you, you know, watched the video for the first time was exactly what I wanted so it was so funny and even sebastian saw my reaction and then wasn't even prepared for what he was gonna get there you so go. go watch that video on our youtube channel it's a really really good one um but today we're talking about ai artificial intelligence it's such a hot topic right now it's like the buzziest buzzword out there everybody and their grandma is trying to is trying to shove ai down our throats right now it's in our phones it's in our cars um, but really, the automotive industry is kind of like new to this. Then they're kind of racing yeah. to implement it as quickly as possible, which is scary for for us because like we know what happens when automakers rush into new technologies. We should before like even forget kind of the implementation of it and how poorly that can go mm -hmm. when when automakers rush into it. Um, automotive data security is terrible. And, and this isn't just, you know, me, obviously I don't know anything about it. Um, I don't know the, the intimate details of it. And I know that automakers do take it seriously, but if you look at the reports that are out there from kind of whatever, like security firms mm -hmm. that will do these audits of automakers, um, uh, almost every one of them has a failing grade for one reason or another. And that's, you know, as we see more and more of our data shared with automakers as they implement all of these new technologies into their vehicles. So we're already kind of behind the eight ball with that. And now this AI, you know, kind of scary thing that's lurking. <laughs> uh, I hate it. I hate it for a lot of reasons, mm -hmm. professionally and personally, uh, and and. So this is the other side of it is my fear of like, what does it mean for, you know, all of us with our data being shared? And even though it's supposed to be, you know, this anonymous data, you never know how bad actors are going to take that and use it and figure out a way to tie things. Look, OK, this is this is off, you know, off topic, but I think it kind of runs parallel. Not too long ago, um, two, I think it was two publications in France were able to figure out where the, so I think they did 
Jill Biden, Joe Biden, and Donald Trump, and then as well as Macron in, in France and a couple other world leaders, they were able to track kind of the movements and the locations of these world leaders with without official agendas being updated mm -hmm. just based on Strava data. Strava is like a fitness app, right, that a lot of people use. A lot of my friends use it. And you can track your bike rides and your runs mm -hmm. and stuff like that. They were able to figure it out based on the, the you know, Secret Service and whatever the French version is, uh, these officers using that information. So that, and that wasn't like nefarious. That was them saying, hey, look, guys, this is something to be concerned There's about. clearly a hole in the security there, Exactly. Right? So yeah. how do we know that the same thing isn't possible with, you know, more and more data being generated as we drive and now bringing AI into the mix? Yeah. Terrible. It's really scary for me, especially because um, most, well, let's say like a big majority of the new cars that are available right now are all connected to the internet. And that's being sold to us as like a hugely beneficial technology that'll make you more connected and safer and all this stuff. Um, but nobody's talking about the security. Yeah. And even even the most secure companies like banks and stuff are they have been data breaches there yeah. too, right? And so it I, I just don't think people understand people who are using AI. They think it's like so amazing and it's life changing. It's going to yeah. be great. But they're using it without really thinking about the implications, right? For so sure. for me personally, I I've I've messed around with it before, but I I hate the idea that like everything I put into there is like feeding the machine, right? So that is literally why I have never done it. Mm -hmm. And I would consider, I mean, it's not really the the AI that we're talking about now and and the one that's kind of, you know, become the the norm, but I remember you know, kind of depth of the pandemic um, in my, one of my group chats with my buddies, it became really popular to use that, um, reface. It was like a, an app or a website where you could like take videos and, and put someone's face on it. And, oh yeah. And the, these guys were, you know, just throwing these back and forth. And my thing was like, man, you're, f you're feeding your friends and your family members faces into this machine. You have no idea who is behind this and what it can be used what, for exactly. And you're just uploading these photos cause you want to make a funny little video, but it's like, you have to think, and yes, uh, you could accuse me of, of, you know, just kind of skirting through the, the, you know, terms and conditions of apps. Right. I download stuff, but I usually, even then I try to make sure that I'm only downloading apps from like trusted, mm -hmm. like Google, for example, we've talked about this before, you know, if there was a, tech giant that I trusted, I would probably say it's Google uh, because I know it has our data, but it's just like, it's, it's so big. Um, and there does seem to be more transparency than, than most. So it's like, oh, I have Google drive and Gmail and whatnot. I don't have any games on my phone. Uh, anything from some kind of like shady, you know, third party developer that I'm like, I don't really want to take that risk. And so, yes, I, I still accept the terms and conditions, but I try to protect myself. I would never put, you know, friends and family's faces in some mm -hmm. sort of AI generator because I'm like, I don't know where those are going to end up. And it's just it, it's another layer to this idea of we're just hurtling towards an AI driven future. And I and I hate that for a lot of reasons, yeah. um, mostly because there are no guardrails in place yeah. right now for how that stuff will be used, right? And we've seen what happens before when the technology is adopted so quickly and there's no government regulations or guide. Like, we know what happened to Facebook and, yeah. and how bad, um, you know, the damage it did with misinformation and, like, you know, yeah. basically upending a democracy. Like, it's yeah. really serious stuff we're talking about. And I'm worried that AI is the next and, step. And even when you look at, look, I understand um, it's it's a complex you know, process to reverse, but open text was, um, you know, registered as a not for profit. It was supposed to be this like, you know, right. altruistic, like for the good of humanity, but now, now the leadership, profit. well, they, they, it's not yet, but what they're trying to do is spin off these different business units, which is easier said than done. But the point is even these companies that were founded on the principles of, of, you know, goodness are like, no, where, you know, we see the profitability, so who cares? And this is, again, with, like you said, without guardrails in place, 
who, how do we know? Now, before, I know we've wasted, I'm not wasted, but we've spent <laughs> a lot of time talking about kind of, you know, sidebar stuff. Another one for, for Jody and I, as journalists, the idea of AI absolutely, and I, I say this as strongly as possible, absolutely disgusts both of us. I mean, for me, it's basically like plagiarism, yeah, right? Absolutely. Because you're not, and you're, if, especially if you're putting your own byline on it, yeah. like how can you put your own byline on something that you had nothing to do with? Yeah. Like, okay, you can write a prompt, but that doesn't mean that you're a journalist, right? Exactly. That to and, me is no different than, than sorry, just if you're, if let's say that I, you know, take the, the, the computer out of it. Mm-hmm. If I'm paying you to, to ghost write, for me or an artist. Yeah. If I go, Hey, can you paint this, this picture? And then I put my name on it. Did I paint that? No, someone else did. It's no different. And, and we're, we're seeing it a little bit more and a little bit more, um, it being implemented. I know there's been some arguments about, Oh, well for research. Sure. I guess you could, you know, ask an AI mm-hmm. again. I don't even really know how these things work, but you could ask some AI tool to gather all of the, you know, reports on whatever subject. Okay. That maybe isn't that bad, but I think it just, it's the start of a slippery slope. Yeah. And it's such a gray zone right now. Like even very respected journalists are, are using this. Um, yeah. and it, it worries me a little bit, but mostly because, uh, people have this idea that like AI is the truth Yeah, and that's not that's just not how it works. Like when, no. whenever the couple times that I have messed around with it just to see what it's all about, yeah. it was full of errors yeah. and just downright mistakes because it's gathering um, from the pool of information that's out there, which we all know isn't always the truth. And it's and that's the thing, right? I I we talked about this in the office last year, and I said it's easy for a bad actor or even somebody who thinks it's funny to manipulate that if mm-hmm. you keep feeding that exactly. information. And yeah, I know some of these AI companies are trying to, you know, put good info out there, but that does it's like Wikipedia, mm-hmm. right? The reason why Wikipedia can't be cited as like a, a truly trusted source is because I could go on there right now and change some entry and that would, unless it got caught, that would be mm-hmm. considered you know, and that would be a published entry. Yeah. And then people would look at that and say, oh, this must be true because exactly. somebody added it. Right? Do you remember that image that that Carl generated in the office? And it was like, create like a cool hipster Jody and it, <laughs> it had a mustache on you. Yeah. I feel like these AI tools kind of tell you what you what they think you want to hear. I mean, and so even when I was doing uh, some research for this episode, right, I was reading into AI a lot and a lot of the information out there that is about AI yeah. was published by AI companies. There you go. So it's like, how am I supposed to trust that as a yeah. legitimate source? It's yeah. marketing material, yeah. right? Like, yeah. they're obviously not going to talk about yeah. the downsides of AI. Don't worry, guys. We're great. Yeah, we're d- don't worry. We got this. And so, like, that kind of stuff really worries me. Um, and, and AI is already being used in a lot of cars right now. Again, it's still really early days. So I just wanted to go through a couple ways uh, that it's used now. Um, so it for safety is a really big one. Like... AI uh, is implemented in a lot of safety systems. Uh, Facial recognition is becoming more and more common, which also freaks me out a little bit. But the idea behind a lot of these like in-car cameras that have that are connected to AI systems is that they're meant to like monitor your awareness, you know, make sure you're paying attention. They'll 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 catch you if you're feel if you look drowsy or angry um, and they'll kind of like customize the car's experience to match your mood, which is like kind of not that useful for me and I and I'm really uncomfortable with the idea of in-car yeah. cameras especially cuz there is a BMW oh actually a Mercedes I was driving where you can't permanently turn off the interior camera Yeah that's there I'd put tape over it for sure Oh yeah it's would, just 100%. so gross and then I read this thing and it was again by an AI company that they they did a study and they said um drivers in cars if they have if they're aware they're being recorded they won't act so aggressive and foolish. Well, I mean, like, obviously, yeah. but to what, like, I just think that's so gross. I don't know. Well, and then, because that, then that is feeding manipulated yeah. information or manipulated data. But my, my other thing is, so let's look at the advanced safety side mm-hmm. of it, right? I understand, you know, again, the intention is good, yeah. right? But here's the thing, regardless of 
where we're headed with this. Um, artificial intelligence, there's no emotion connected to it. And that's something that you have to remember. If we take a look back, not that long ago, last year, the year before, there was that incident in San Francisco with one of those cruise autonomous, you know, taxis, whatever you want to call them. And it grabbed a hold of that woman and dragged her like hundreds of feet. Right. And it's like, it, it can't, sure. It can, you know, it's, it's intelligent in a sense, but it's also not doing the same sort of checks and balances that, that a human would. It's Mm -hmm. not applying emotion to the situation as well as intelligence. That's what makes driving so unique, right? And we always talk about how you have to be prepared for these crazy situations. And yeah, sure, a computer like like that are the computers behind these AI tools, that's one of the things that's always bragged about that they can think so much faster than mm-hmm. a human. Sure, that's true. But if you are an emotional being as in a human, <laughs> you can also apply that that AI can't. If your decision, if you are hurtling towards a guardrail and hurtling towards a group of school children, right? It's like, how does how do we know that AI is going to make the right decision, quote unquote, the right decision? Yeah. Because, you know, I'm telling you, even the, the most like cold hearted human being is going to make the right decision in that situation, right? Yep. Is, is AI going to do that or is it going to, because I remember not that long ago, it came out and I don't, I can't remember which company it was, but there was an admission that the implementation of autonomous or semi-autonomous technology, the intent behind it or the default was to preserve uh, and protect the occupants of the vehicle, not other road users. Which That's is, what I'm worried yeah, about. Yeah, which in theory sounds great, but that's actually a really bad thing. It's because, terrible. Yeah. I don't know. It just... And then it, it opens up a question of like, okay, who's liable, right? That's why I'm saying like the, we don't have legislation or guardrails in place for like, what happens when AI messes up? Who's reliable or who's liable? Yeah. Is it the driver? Is it the company? Is it the, is it the software provider that, that licensed its software to the automaker? I'm like, telling you the answer. That's the problem. It's the same thing with autonomous vehicles. I, I years and years ago, 2012, I think, um, or 2013, I wrote a story about, autonomous technology and it was like a round table with GM and a few others and Gowlings, which is this big law firm that represents quite a few different automakers. Uh, and one of the partners at the firm said, you know, the technology is there. Liability is the hang up. Now keep in mind that was like 12, 13 years ago. Oh my and God. here we're still at this spot where it's not ready. Sure. We have blue cruise and, and super cruise, these hands-free highway drive assists, But I personally am still pretty firm in my belief that we're not going to have fully autonomous vehicles. I don't care. The fact that Elon Musk is still promising these robo-taxis is so outrageous to me. But it's like how the problem is how humans and robots, whatever, for lack of a better term, (laughs) how humans and machines coexist, right? Let's even take a look at that. Okay, take the emotion out of it and say that that's a good thing. You can't have these emotional beings coexisting with just these intelligent robots. It has to be all or nothing. What are we going to do? Have a or or your robo lanes on the highway and then human lanes? No. That's not how this is going to work. No, not at all. And I feel like when a lot of companies are talking about autonomous driving, there a lot of these people are saying that it'll be mainstream in 10 years, which I can't see at all, especially in a place like Canada where we have like snow and seasons. Yeah. There's, it just seems impossible to me. Um, and Nobody's figured out how to make those sensors and cameras. No. You know, like Volvo now has that stupid little hump the in the yeah hump in the in the roof of the EX90 that looks pretty terrible. Um, and yeah, okay, it's a Swedish company. You know, there's obviously inclement weather in in Sweden. Volvo's reps are pretty confident that that's the solution, but I still say that that's going to get, you know, that could get covered in ice. If you're, Mm -hmm. and we've talked about this many, many times, like if you are in poor weather conditions, you shouldn't be using, you know, cruise control or, or these safety features anyways. But that's the point is that in those situations, you can then take control of the vehicle and go, well, my car is encased in ice. Guess I'm driving it today. 
A robo taxi can't do that. No. And what are we going to do? Just, you know, oh, they're all grounded today because because yeah. weather sucks. I mean, there was also this video that I saw on TikTok, and it, like, granted, it's TikTok, so I don't fully trust that either. But it was a video of a bunch of like Waymo, uh, basically autonomous vehicles. They were like stuck on a road, just honking at each yeah. other. They they were like in a in a jam, and they did not know how to yeah. get out. So how yeah. they dealt with that was just honking at each other nonstop. And creating more gridlock in the process. You, it's, it's, you see videos sometimes too, and I know it's a little bit different and the, the same amount of research hasn't been applied, but every once in a while you'll see a video of somebody that takes, you know, some, some boxes or pylons and like circles one of those autonomous, um, you know, floor cleaners in a department uh-huh. store and it just stops and spins around and can't move. So now again, you're, you're looking at a situation where, how do we know, just like we're talking about how bad actors can manipulate the data that's being generated by AI, mm-hmm. how do you know that people aren't going to do that? Yeah. Right? Suddenly that you're going to have people that are creating havoc just by some simple thing that a, that an autonomous vehicle can't overcome on its own. Yep. And, and, I, and I just can't, I don't always trust companies and corporations to do the right thing. No. And so I feel like, you know, their intentions might be good, but I really don't think that they're looking at this in like an ethical way um, where there's real solutions to like very real like philosophical dilemmas that nobody's talking about right but like going back a little bit so um like voice assistance in cars is becoming a lot more common for Mm. the longest time they were so useless because you needed to have a specific set of commands otherwise it wouldn't understand you so now they're implementing all of these like natural language systems where you can say something like like hey mercedes it's too hot in here and it will it will change the climate control so that it's cooler and so I feel like the more natural language stuff, that is helpful. But again, is it is it better than pushing a button? I that's, don't think so. That's the part to me that in the time it takes to issue that voice command uh, and hope that it guesses right, that it increases or, or decreases the temperature to your desired, you know, state. Mm-hmm. Why would you not just reach down and change the climate control? Again, I've, I've honestly... This is like my true, maybe it's a hot take. I've honestly yet to see a case where AI, because that's what these, you know, these systems are using, has an actual benefit in the automotive space. That's what I mean. So to me, I would love to see if I could say, if I was driving and I could say, hey, um, find me a noodle restaurant on my way home that has ratings over 4.6 stars Holy. and is not too busy right now because that's stuff that you can't do while you're driving, True. right? And that's stuff that like, unless you have a passenger, it's too distracting True. to do that, right? If I could be like, hey, uh, car, take me to a brewery that has really good hazy IPAs, not West Coast. Yeah. I want hazy New England IPAs. That would be, that would actually make it useful. Okay, I take back what I said earlier. <laughs> I'm all for AI. <laughs> For the first company that can get me that, that would be a Google thing, I guess, right? I mean, come on, Google. We have the information, right? Right yeah. now, I can't even say to Google, find me a gas station that has diesel. Like, it doesn't even understand that command. Yeah. So, something so simple. Yeah. And that's what I mean is that, like, AI is like truly not very useful right now. Oh, for anything. Re- yeah. Okay. I do want to, I know that there's been talk about in, you know, environments like healthcare. Mm. For triage and stuff like that, it could become, you know, pretty helpful. So I don't want to say it's terrible. I Obviously, I don't know enough about it to to make a blanket say. I just mean, if you're looking at the auto, auto space and how we benefit as users, somebody email us at expert at trader.ca. Tell me how we stand to benefit. Because right now I'm telling you, I do not see it. I only see downsides. It's just not useful right yeah, now. Yeah, that's what I mean. So it's... so unless somebody can tell me, give me a, an actual, a tangible example of something that right now you can point to and say, AI has been implemented and here's how it works in a helpful way that goes beyond finding me a hazy IPA <laughs> or Jody with a good noodle spot rated over 4.7. That's what I would like to see. I personally am skeptical, so feel free to try to prove me wrong. Uh, but I just don't see it. And it's it's tricky in cars because it's very difficult to opt out. Yeah. Right? Like once you're once you have a new car, 
and you you have to use these systems. You can't opt out. Yeah. Right. And so that causes some that raises some red flags. But our for phones me. are the same way. I know. Right? I know. But it's it's just. They're I don't think people such, are ready for this. No, and everybody's in such a rush. Again, it's one of those things like gotta have it. Yeah. But if you actually step back and ask why, mm-hmm. people can't answer the same thing with the phone, right? When this software update that got pushed through on my on my iPhone, and I'm like, cool, you know, Apple's like, oh, now with AI, and I'm like, but what does that actually mean for me? Yeah. That okay, you can. I know there's those commercials with that that girl from. Uh, was it Last of Us? And she's like, oh, you know, where did I meet this guy? And then it's like, oh, he looks through her calendar. You met him on such and such a date, and this is his name. Oh, thank God, I remember this guy's name. It's like, okay, is that or or giving the synopsis mm-hmm. of an email or whatever? It's like, is that again, is that really harder than being like, oh man, I'm really I can't remember. I remember we met, but I can't remember your name, then then BSing it with your AI on your phone? I, I can't wait for the first AI case of mistaken identity. I'm sure it's going to happen. It's gonna, that that very feature that yep. Apple has put in the thing that you, you know, oh, yeah, we had the meeting about that book deal. And then that person's like, what book deal? You've never and you're before. like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> Or you've given, like, you know, somebody else information that you weren't supposed to. I Again, it's just like, sure, we're speculating. We're talking a lot about the negatives, but it's like, it's all scary stuff because we don't know. But but even like when it comes to like very simple things, right? Like uh, I have a Hungarian friend. He has an accent. It's not even like a really thick Hungarian mm-hmm. accent, but like none of his voice assistants recognize his totally. voice. They don't understand what he's saying. Jock McCleary. <laughs> Good Scotsman. <laughs> Being in a car with him and getting him to try voice commands or voice to text oh is hysterical. It, like, he finds it funny, too. He's not offended by it. But I could also understand how it's not very inclusive. No. And that's the thing about AI is that they've done studies that it's, like, inherently flawed. It's racist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's- Just because it's, 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 it's informed by the information that is out there. And unfortunately, a lot of the information out there is incredibly biased. What That's if we didn't it know that it, that AI actually didn't stand for artificial intelligence? It was Aryan intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. He went there. Uh, well, maybe it's time for our Ask an Expert Oh, question. yeah. We, we've completely gone off the rails this episode, guys. We th- There's just so much to talk about when it comes to this. Uh, we probably have to do another episode. But uh, before this Ask an Expert, here's a message from your friends at Auto Trader. Having trouble finding your perfect car at the perfect price? The answer is Auto Trader. Car prices are dropping across Canada, and Auto Trader has hundreds of thousands of new and used cars to choose from. Get a great deal on your perfect car by visiting Auto Trader today. This week's Ask an Expert comes to us from Right Lane Hog, a.k.a. Mike, our Yo, buddy. Yo, Mike, what up? One of our loyal supporters is honestly one of the first people to comment on every YouTube video we put out we there. We appreciate the support. So and, much. And also, I just love how, you know, Mike loves Canadian content. It's not just our stuff. I know in talking to, you know, some other journalists that they know, you know, that he's commenting on their stuff and, and engaged. And so, Mike, we all appreciate how how involved you are. And um, this, I think you've got some, I just kind of glanced at the question and I, I think you've got some good, good points. And again, you've gone above and beyond here, but I'm, I'm curious to, to, to see what this is all about. Okay. So he had um, some, he did a little bit of research after listening to our episode on where did all the cheap cars go? Um, which, which you guys all love. So thank you so much for the support on that. A lot of people were like, yeah, we've been talking about this, but no one else is talking about yeah. it. So we're really glad that we did that episode. Um, so he was looking back into uh, like a 2002 Toyota Matrix. Okay. Uh, he found a review on Auto Trader that our contributor Chris Chase did. Wow, Chris has been doing it for that long. Yeah, back when it was Autos.ca, Holy. he's been doing it for a long time. Chase is on the case. And so back then in that was 2000, a little Paw Patrol joke, by the way, that you just oh, totally I, I glossed don't over. know Paw Patrol. For the longest time, I thought Paw Patrol was a show about an old troll, like, like Papa Smurf. My pa. Paw Patrol. I literally thought that until I had a niece. And then I was like, oh, it's a dog. Anyway, um, back then in 2002, a Toyota Matrix was 17.5 with destination, starting price, base. 
Okay. Uh, autom- no automatic transmission, no air conditioning, not a lot of features. Back then, um, the minimum wage in Ontario was six eighty five. Okay, but I'm going to do this in real time. Okay. Okay. He's so he put seventeen five into an inflation calculator, which equals twenty eight thousand mm. dollars today. Okay, but but here's my okay. Actually, I'll let you. I don't know if there's more to it. There's a little more to the okay. question. So he he basically wants to know um, why don't Canadians get the cheaper base models that a lot of Americans do. So a lot of automakers, when they bring their cars to Canada, our mm-hmm. base model is like a few trims up what the U.S. gets. Yeah, it's honestly, it's usually just based on volume and what they're going to sell and also, you know, what what they can reasonably request in production, right? We're fighting for, you know, in as a Canadian market, right? We're fighting for a small slice of the pie. Uh, does, you know, is it justified to bring in the trims that people are buying anyways in the eyes of these automakers. Absolutely. I had this conversation with someone not that long ago. And I said, why is this? It was, it was about the, I can't remember what car it is, so I'm not going to make it up. But um, I asked, well, why do we not get like this lower trim? And they said, well, nobody buys it anyways. And I said, okay, but your advertised pricing would be lower. The get, get in the door price. When I worked at Subaru, we knew nobody was buying a base Impreza sedan. No one okay. manual, you know, hubcaps. It was just like stripped down sedan, but it was nineteen nine nine five for an all wheel drive compact car. That looks really good in advertised pricing mm-hmm. when you can say it's the only compact car, the only all wheel drive vehicle in Canada that starts under twenty grand. But even though no one's buying it, yeah, because it was a get get you in mm. the door price, right? Right. But here's the thing, though, the matrix. While I appreciate the research and and your point about inflation. Um, the matrix wasn't the, the cheap car, right? Like the matrix was still a, a kind of premium over the Corolla because it was this hatchback, slightly bigger version of the Corolla. Um, talk about the Toyota Yaris. Yeah. Right. That, that would be the, the kind of base car. But I mean, it's not here anymore, so we can't even compare, right? But that started at like 12 grand. I think I remember it was right around 12,000 bucks. So Adjusting for inflation, what's that? Seventeen today? I don't know. We'd have to plug it into the calculator to find let's, out. Jody, let's do that right now. Okay, let's see it. So let's just say, obviously, I'm I'm you know just making up a a number right now, but just to put it into some context, exactly. I think it would be interesting so, to see. Let's say something that cost twelve thousand dollars. Wow! If only I had AI to do this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, guys. But I also want to bring up the fact that these days you can't buy a car that doesn't have air conditioning or ABS no. brakes. What year? Any, sorry, what year? 2002. Was, 2002. Yeah. Okay. Would cost what in 2024? 19 one, Okay. One five nine. Okay, that's still under twenty, and that's what we talked about. Mm-hmm. Where of all these sub twenty thousand? There's one available in Canada, and that's the Mitsubishi yep. Mirage. Right. Sad times. So anyways, Mike, we appreciate your question, your research, uh, your loyal support, and the fact that there was a I there was a video recently that we talked about, oh, you, you know, the smart people subscribe. And, and Mike was like, yeah, why don't more people subscribe? Why don't more people subscribe? What do you like to say? Mash that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. I don't remember what else it is. I mean, we just put out so much great stuff. So I'm always happy to see people watching it's and true. supporting. So thank you, Mike. Um, If any of you would have questions to ask Dan or I, you can email us at expert at trader.ca. But that wraps up this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Drive safe and we'll see you next time. Bye, guys.